Welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I'd like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the land, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Renee Lertzman to talk us through climate psychology and how we can be effective in driving climate action. Renee is an internationally recognised climate psychologist and engagement strategist dedicated to accelerating broad-scale global system change. She's worked with a broad range of organisations from the World Wildlife Fund to the White House. Renee is also an esteemed author and in 2019 gave a TED talk on turning climate anxiety into action. Welcome Renee and thank you so much for joining me today. Now your TED talk focused on turning climate anxiety into action, which I think is a fantastic approach and I do highly recommend everyone listen to it. But what I'm really curious about is how you approach climate denial. Okay. So the TED Talk was recorded in 2019 and then it came out right when COVID was unraveling the world. And I think everything I was talking about is as relevant, if not more so now. So the question about denial, I think we spend a lot of energy and time, those working on these issues, uh, trying to figure out what is actually going on. How do we navigate it? How do we deal with it? And I think it's extremely important to situate denial psychologically. Denial is an extremely well-known defense mechanism. Right. If you go back and you look at what we know about the human psyche, and I don't mean just individuals, I mean, we employ strategies for managing unwanted, distressing or threatening information. Yeah. And this is just normal. And so denial is one of many defense mechanisms. And I think it's extremely important to situate it that way. Because if we really understand what's going on, it can influence and change the way that we work with it, understand it and navigate it. So starting at the baseline, asking this question, well, what might be going on? Like, why is this denialism so active and so intense? And I think it's extremely important to start to inquire through the lens of this is the defense mechanism, what might be going on underneath the surface that leads people to refute and deny reality. And often that will take us into the terrain of anxiety, fear, people feeling overwhelmed, and often people not really knowing even how to engage with an issue like this especially if it brings up conflict between one's identity, let's say as part of a group that prides itself on certain values that they perceive climate is in conflict with. A lot of people don't know how to engage. And I've I've met and I've talked to many climate skeptics and deniers in the US. And so I know from that experience that it is not cut and dry. That often what we find, if you scratch the surface and you actually pay attention to what is being communicated, what is often there under the surface is an incredible sense of feeling aggrieved, feeling vulnerable, feeling angry, left out, and righteousness, right? That kind of like, you're not going to take this away from me, and who do you think you are? Yeah, I see that a lot of my family live in a rural area. So I definitely see that in my interactions with them. There is definitely a a culture of not really engaging with the, the concept of sustainability because they view it as that threat to their livelihoods. And so I think that's like a really hard thing to engage with. And I suppose that's my my big question is like, how do you approach talking about it, even when you understand that it's coming from that defensive place? Mm -hmm. 
what kind of language do you use when you, you're talking about it to try and not trigger that defense mechanism? It's tricky. It's complicated. So I take my cue from practices that work well in health sector. So I've, I've trained and worked with clinicians who work with people around uh, health and behavior change and so forth. And I really um, find that very powerful and effective, which is how to be a guide. And so where we want to start, if you're coming at this from a, as a guide, is that you first want to seek to understand, uh, okay, tell me, like, help me understand where you're coming from. You know, I respect you. Like, I'm not going to try to change your mind, but I want to try to understand. And then you ask for permission to share where are you coming from? Would it be all right with you? Are you open to hearing where I'm coming from? Because it's different from your perspective. Would you be open to hearing about that? And that's really important. People can either say yes or no. Uh, and usually people will say, yeah, okay, you know, uh, sure. And so then you, sh you, you, you start with, of course, like first person, this is how I'm experiencing this. This is what is coming up for me. I'm feeling incredibly scared, overwhelmed, whatever that is, right? But you're not trying to change the other person. And then you can move into having some sort of dialogue. But what's really important is that you want to demonstrate that you are not going to try to change the, the other person's mind. So it's important to actually be genuine, to be coming from that place of understanding without trying to, you know, go, all right, I need to convince you. I, I have this specific agenda. What we often don't talk about in this space is how we manage our own internal reactions and triggers and sense of frustration. Because yeah. it's one thing to say that, but if you're literally dealing with someone like today on Twitter, someone posted something. I don't usually engage on Twitter with like, arguments and debates. It's just like a total time suck. But someone posted something provocative, which was like, why are we talking about protecting water? Water doesn't need our protection. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, normally, I wouldn't go there. But I orated very gently. And I was like, you know, I can see that perspective. And I think that what people mean by protection is protection from human activity that's maybe gonna, you know, impact the quality of water. Maybe we mean protection from overuse of a limited resource, uh -huh. <laughs> but I was feeling so triggered. But the thing is, is because I've been working on this and practicing for so long, I do not experience that same kind of, where you just are so flooded with emotion that it's hard to actually come into these interactions from that place of receptivity and curiosity. So there's an inside job aspect to this work, which is checking with yourself before going into these interactions. Like yeah. how, where am I at? What's my attitude? What's my energy like? And really practicing self-awareness um, and noticing when you start to get triggered having some practices to manage that, which might include not engaging or stepping away. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Like there, there's things that we can do. But the other thing I think that's really important that helps me is I try to come at this from a, a lot of compassion. Now, yeah. when I say that, it's very triggering for a lot of people working in the ESG policy space because there's a confusion of compassion with acceptance, like, oh, I'm just letting you off the hook. And that's not what compassion is. But compassion for me is it's almost like when I'm confronted with people who are so in denial, what I focus on is, oh, wow, this must be so painful for them to have to come to terms with what can I do to be a guide and to lower the stakes enough for other people to be even open to looking at this and accepting this as part of our reality. Yeah. Okay. I definitely understand that, you know, having that compassion perspective and I, I try to engage with that myself. And I, I know one thing my, my own personal um, 
therapist mentioned to me because I have ADHD and that comes with like emotional dysregulation as you're probably aware. So just having a pause before you respond to something that could probably be a useful tool Mm -hmm. when, you know, having that, experiencing that frustration when encountering people. I think that practice of taking a pause is really important for all of us. And it doesn't necessarily mean only if you're in an interaction. So I want to be really clear that the work I do is with organizations, with leaders and with teams, it's not so much focused on having an interaction with someone, although we all are having interactions all the time. So I think that actually bringing awareness and attention to how we go into interactions is something that we are not looking at and talking about enough. And I feel like to be an effective practitioner in this space, it does involve learning how to take a pause. So you mentioned that you primarily work with organizations. Can you tell me a bit about your approach to getting people or organizations themselves to engage with climate action while also meeting the needs or desires of multiple stakeholders? So I don't try to get anyone to do anything. That's the first part. (laughs) Um, So I feel really strongly about approaching this work as a guide. I think that's a very powerful lens and way of being and working that if we were to do that more, we would see more progress happening. Now, what I mean by guide is someone invites me in to maybe have an initial conversation or to explore something or give a talk or workshop or But usually it starts with like someone is curious and they're like, there's something here. Let's have a conversation. And my primary focus at that point is to listen, to seek to understand the context and where the situation is. Right. And usually what I find is that there's a there's a core group of people within an organization who are trying to make change happen. And they are surrounded by and in in dealing with a lot of dynamics that make it hard for them to have as much impact as they want to have. And so one of the most important things we start with is, you know, doing that kind of understanding of the context and what's happening. But then I will often partner with teams and organizations and um, train them or maybe provide some guidance on how they can go out and have interactions and conversations with their key stakeholders, starting with those who are most friendly and supportive, Yeah, maybe in some cases across the organization in different parts of it, right? So it's almost like going out and doing a bit of a listening tour. But when we go out and do these listening activities, it, it is a form of stakeholder engagement. It's like, we kind of forget that every contact is a form of engagement. And so going out and being present in how we listen and have those conversations is super important. Then coming back and looking at what are we hearing, where are some insights or some themes that are coming up where people are wanting to see more action in some ways. And then my emphasis, and a lot of this is reflected in my body of work called Project Inside Out. You know, the emphasis is really on how can that team provide their stakeholders with tools and resources that help them be effective. So it's a little bit of like a train the trainer model where if I'm successful, then I'm helping enable groups within an organization to show up and be more skillful at the complex stakeholder engagement, which does take time. It's really based on listening skills, but also knowing how to deal with resistance And so I'm really interested in building and nurturing people's core capabilities and then they can go out and do what they need to do. So helping them with the human interaction element. What kind of strategies do you suggest for dealing with that kind of resistance? Well, it has a lot to do with, as I mentioned before, listening and active listening and actively empathizing. I don't want to get too hung up on the interpersonal dynamic because a lot of what I'm talking about relates to how you would design a strategy or campaign or a communication or report or whatever it is you're putting out into the world. It might vary in what it looks like, but it really comes back to ensuring that the audience knows that you understand where their ambivalence is. We need to understand ambivalence 
at a much deeper level than we currently do. Ambivalence is when people are feeling pulled in different directions where they are experiencing conflict. They may not be fully conscious of the conflict, but they feel part of them is on board with you and part of them is not on board. You recognize ambivalence by people basically kind of responding with yes, but or yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but then you don't hear from them again, or they don't respond to your messages. And that's ambivalence. They're feeling kind of stuck. And so it's extremely important as practitioners to know how to recognize ambivalence and how to then work with it by naming it and acknowledging it. And to say, so you might be feeling this way over here and you might be also feeling this way over here. Is that right? People then have the opportunity to say, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Or no, let me clarify, or you've got it wrong or whatever. But then it's like, and that helps build trust. Like, okay, this is not another tone deaf ESG person. Right. Um, and then as a guide, you want to, you want to guide people through reconciling with the ambivalence where it's like, well, okay, so what I'm hearing is this and this over here. Can you imagine this is where open-ended prompts come in? Okay. So you engaging like with curiosity and questions. Yeah, you, you are the one who's asking the questions, but we push our solutions onto people and we then are met with resistance. And whereas what I'm talking about is you really want to ask questions that evoke from the other why they may or may not be open, receptive or on board. And you meet that with, okay, I may not agree with that. In fact, it might actually be factually wrong. You don't try to correct them and fix it. You basically say, okay, I get that. I see where you're coming from, but this is a different perspective. Are you open to considering that? You know what I mean? It's almost like martial arts where you're really working with someone. Yeah. I think that there's a perception from people themselves that triggers that sort of like FOMO, the fear of missing out, that if you're going to be a good, sustainable person and live a sustainable life, that it means missing out on nice things. Do you encounter that mm -hmm. sort of feeling a lot? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge legacy that we're dealing with from decades of not great environmental communication <laughs> like we're having to do a lot of repair and cleanup from a lot of people basically saying we need to change we need to stop doing this stop doing that let go of this let go of that reduce this there's a lot of truth to that but there's a lot of gain and benefit that we also get but this is why this work is fundamentally change management i mean this is about working with people on change so yeah. let's actually understand the psychology of change, which is we're going to have to be able to meet that FOMO with a lot of grace and skill and compassion. I can't convince you. It's just like not a good use of my energy to yeah. say it's not so bad. Like in actuality, we need to stop flying and consuming and so forth because we want to leave a better world. You mentioned that with organizations and stuff that a lot of the communication is not that interactional style. It's a one-way thing. How does that kind of communication work through an impersonal medium, like a report or social media even? Well, it looks like doing some research or insight gathering to understand where the anxieties and benevolence and aspirations are of your target audience. So it starts with that. That's a tune, which is the guiding principle in Project Inside Out, number one. Yep. Um, and then two, you want to communicate in a one-way format. You want to demonstrate that you are aware and you want to acknowledge that by saying you might be feeling this or some people might be thinking this or you can use research or you can use statistics or you can use data, but you want to acknowledge that you are aware of what people may be thinking or feeling as they encounter the piece of communication. And then you want to be able to say, and guess what? We are aware of that. And that's precisely why we are doing what we're doing, or we need you to be part of this or why you matter. But, you know, often we skip that part and we just focus on pushing something out. And without that first part, we don't necessarily have that level of connection and trust, which is why advertising works so well, you know, <laughs> like 
there's a reason why uh, marketing and advertising works really well because they do their homework. They actually invest a ton in consumer insight. They get deep into the psyche of people and then they come up with these ads and marketing and brand strategy that gets there. I'd like to see a little bit more of that sensibility with this kind of work, which is a more empathetic kind of human based approach where it's like, okay, we're inviting people into a conversation. I was on Twitter recently and, and saw a few threads on degrowth that needing to stop the exponential growth impacts. Is that something that gets talked about a lot in your field? Not a whole lot. I work with business mainly. Yeah. And I'm very interested in partnering with business and with the change agents within business to drive change at a systemic level. I think that if conversations about growth and about profit margins and all that, I'm more focused on enabling people to have those conversations more effectively. How do we take something like that, which just these supercharged topics about like yeah. <laughs> asking people to rethink our entire model about profitability and about what is a good life. And like, these are really big existential human questions. And I want to help ensure that people working on these issues are at least well equipped yep. to navigate these really, these, these landmines so that they can be more effective. That makes a lot of sense. Cause yeah, it is huge. That kind of growth and consumer model is entrenched in our culture. So it's difficult to try and even conceptualize, I think, like begin having a conversation about moving away from that. I did want to ask because one thing that I do come across myself as well is with like climate skeptics, they have really specific talking points. I feel like that that's part of that defense mechanism where they'll, you know, have things like climate change is, you know, overreported or they'll, they'll say it's, you know, a natural thing that's happening anyway it's already happened in the past it's not like you know that it's not man-made or it'll like move on to like there's nothing we can do about it anyway so just you know live your life and or she'll be right we'll figure it out so do you have different approaches when coming across something that's maybe been like the messaging that maybe isn't coming from the person themselves but then repeating something they've heard well, that's the case most of the time. And this isn't new. I mean, I'm thinking about a research paper that came out almost 20 years ago that was so insightful where it was this researcher, I think in Germany called Suzanne Stoll Lehman. She did this beautiful analysis of all the things that you just described. They're very common. They get circulated and they're often produced in the media and they're reproduced. I mean, this again is like how we make sense of the world. We we are meaning making, sense making. And so we're drawing on repertoires primarily through, you know, our tribe, our media and so forth. And then we just kind of pick it up and run with it. And then when you're doing interviews with people or having conversations, which I've done like hundreds of, you hear these things over and over again. And it's like, they're literally just channeling what is being said on Fox TV or by some pundit on talk radio or whatever well i mean that's just what happens we do that too yeah it's not like a them or them it's just what people do yeah exactly and so a lot of climate activists and advocates are also like parroting positions that they picked up you know from someone they read or whatever that they love and so that's just a big part of what we do the the issue is when we get stuck in our different sets of meaning making but again, it's just a way of making sense of the world that takes away the pain. It's yeah. a de-escalating of the pain because it's really painful to have to confront climate change. And I wish that we were more attentive to that. But we're in pain too. Like everyone who's having to deal with this is dealing on some level with feeling stressed, right? And we all manage it in very different ways. And some manage it by being super positive and just focusing on what's possible and very solution oriented. And some people deal with it by being in denial and saying, you know, this is humans, we've dealt with like major cycles of the climate for millennia, you know, and some people deal with it by saying, you know, this is a conspiracy theory. And I also want to ask, 
because we are seeing some of the actual physical impacts of climate change now, extreme weather events and, you know, heat waves, bushfires, floods, all of that. What kind of effects, you know, like psychologically speaking, are we likely to see in people as things continue to escalate? That question is so interesting to me because I get asked that a lot and it just seems very straightforward that we're going to see a lot of stress. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So. We're going to see uh, people, you know, stressed, anxious, feeling overwhelmed, but also mobilized and activated. And I think that's happening too. We want to be really careful at this time because if people feel stress and anxiety and they don't know what to do with it or where to go with it, it can easily go into avoidance or depression or people tuning out. And we see that with young people right now in a really big way around the world. And so I think it's time to really recognize that this is heavy existential stuff and that we need to be able to help people process it. And the way that we process stuff is, and this is all on my website, projectinsideout.net, designed to help other people process what's happening. And one of the ways is by naming and acknowledging and being real about what's going on and letting people have their feelings and reactions to it. And then getting into smaller groups. So any time you've got the ability to get people into small groups and having good quality interaction with each other, or even if it's a really large group, breaking people into small groups. So I, and I mean, like, This could happen at a really big event. It could happen at a concert where you've got like thousands of people there. You could literally have people turn to someone next to them and take two minutes or three minutes to connect on a human level and just say, how are you doing right now? You know, like that in itself actually would be game changing because it gives people much more resilience to cope and to handle this when you know that you're not alone and you feel connected with other humans and you feel like your experience is actually normal and natural, then that really helps set the stage for people being able to imagine what a different path might be and what my role in that or my part of that might be. But without that, those moments of reflection and connection, it's very hard to get there. And then people just kind of like shut down. And a lot of people are in families where they can't talk to family members because they'll just be shut down. They'll be attacked or told to shut up or whatever. And so that's a very painful place to be. A lot of people are in right now. And so you have to find where the connection and the support is. Find those networks and plug in so that you know that you're part of something, you're not alone. Because For some reason, we tend to just go into this, like, forgetting that there are how many humans on the planet, you know, there's billions of people. I think that that in itself is, like, isolating because it's, like, there's so many that you can't really conceptualize it. Like, how do you connect with 7 billion people? Yeah, we don't need to connect with every human (laughs) on the planet. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But we can connect with those we are meant to connect with and trust that the reality, I mean, this goes back to the whole idea of networks and this is where systems thinking and network thinking that's starting to become more prevalent is really, really powerful. It's like, oh, I'm just one person, but I'm part of a network. And actually anything that happens in the planet, I don't care if it's like you're the president of a country or if you are google or bill gates or prime minister or whatever like no one has all the agency and so what we want to be doing is looking at activation of networks through the lens of agency and power and so that's the reframe from oh it's just me i feel overwhelmed i don't know what i can do it's like we've got to get out of that cognitive trap and remind ourselves like, okay, I'm part of a network. I'm part of the human network. It's yeah. not all on me to figure this out. In fact, I can't. I wrestle with that a lot. I feel like very aware of the burden of feeling like, what am I gonna do about this? And I better do whatever I can. And of course I act that, I live that way, 
or I wouldn't be doing this conversation on a Saturday night. <laughs> but I, I also recognize that it's not all on me. It yeah. is absolutely not all on any one person. And then I can kind of rest and relax a little bit more and, and remember, oh my gosh, there's so many amazing, thoughtful, smart people like yourselves who are investing your energy. This is Sunday morning for you. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's like you're putting your energy in your lives, like you're doing it because you care, because you're committed. And, and I think remembering that, like, oh, yeah, like, there are so many people doing all kinds of amazing things. So what can I do? What can, how can I plug into that? How can I be a part of that network? And yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because I think, you know, we all have people that we're connected to in so many different ways so yeah trying to like plug into that and, and working together to make the changes can be really powerful definitely from my perspective i see like all of the things humans have done in the in history has been working together so i think exactly <laughs> so <laughs> i'll end it there but thank you so much for joining me because it's been a great conversation really interesting to learn more about that psychological aspect of climate change.